Hello, welcome to today's webinar titled Gendered Radicalization, How Gender in Place Matter to Countering Violent Extremism. My name is Evian Leidig, and I'm a research fellow at the International Center for Counterterrorism in The Hague, Netherlands, and an affiliate at the Center for Research on Extremism at the University of Oslo. The seminar today is hosted by the Consortium for Research on Terrorism and International Crime. The consortium has existed since 2002 and today consists of the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs, NUPI, the Norwegian Defense Research Establishment, FFI, the Police University College, PHS, and the Center for Research on Extremism, CREX. Rita Augustad Knudsen is a senior researcher at NUPI, and she is the managing director of the consortium with Professor Tore Birgo at CREX as the academic director. I'm very pleased to present today's speaker, Dr. Catherine Brown, who is a reader in Islamic studies at the University of Birmingham in the UK. Her work focuses on the intersection between religion, gender, and violent extremism. She is the author of Gender, Religion, Extremism, Finding Women in Anti-Radicalization, published by Oxford University Press in 2020, and is the co-author of Countering Violent Extremism, Making Gender Matter, published by Palgrave Macmillan in 2021. Dr. Brown also serves as a consultant for UN Women, NATO, the EU, and is an expert witness in court cases involving women and children associated with terrorism and violent extremism. Her most recent work looks at the role of the arts and humanities in resilience to violent extremism. And just some practical information to note. The seminar today will be recorded and uploaded onto YouTube shortly afterwards. Kathleen will present for 20 to 30 minutes, followed by a Q&A. For those joining us today, please do submit your questions in the Q&A function of Teams. So without further ado, I leave it to Dr. Catherine Brown. Thank you so much for hosting me. It is a real pleasure today to be able to speak to you all via uh, the wonders of Microsoft Teams um, and the internet. And I hope as well that what I have to say to you today will be of interest and hopefully as well challenge your own thinking about terrorism, violent extremism, and what societies around the world can do to counter and prevent this. Today, I'm taking this opportunity to talk about the most recent book that I co-authored with Dr. Elizabeth Pearson and Emily Winterbotham. This co-authored book came about partly due to our combined interests. So over the next 30 minutes, 20 or 30 minutes, I'll be honest, um, what I will do is I'll explain a bit about our diverse background as a co-authoring team, which will help you then understand the process and the methods which we used in order to uncover some of the data and the findings in the book. And then, of course, I will tell you a bit about what we found and give you some conclusions. Those findings, um, I would suggest to you that two of them are about process and methodology, um, which is often something overlooked in terrorism research. The second thing in our conclusions is a conceptual one. We're academics after all. And then the other two are really about policy implications of our work. So why did the three of us come together in order to write this book? Dr Elizabeth Pearson, who's now at Royal Holloway in the United Kingdom, has spent many years talking about right wing masculine extremism. So here she's really interested in masculinities and what happens when we really consider men as men in our analysis of violent extremism. And one of the things that her research engages in is the way in which the far right reacts to and kind of responds to some of the claims made by Islamist jihadist groups. And that is where she and I started our conversations in this area. My own research is very much focused on why it is that women choose to participate in violent extremist groups, specifically those related to Islamist extremism. And over the past 10 years or so, um, this has also involved working with women and children and courts and practitioners in their efforts to uh, engage in rehabilitative work, prevention work, and of course, countering work. Now, our third author, Emily Winterbotham comes from a slightly different perspective. She is now the Director of Counterterrorism at the Royal United Services Institute, that is RUSI, also in the UK. 
And her background is really interesting. She has worked in Afghanistan, Nigeria, Kenya, um, in a whole variety of places working on issues to do with stabilization and more recently to do with how outside of the Northern European and North American context, preventing and countering violent extremism have been implemented. And in that work, she was incredibly aware of the drive and the emphasis on working with communities, on ensuring that communities were active participants and co-authors or co-designers of countering and preventing violent extremism programs. Yet she noted that this was something not always brought into play in the North American and European context. In fact, some of the many criticisms of um, what in the UK we call prevent is structured around this idea that prevent is superimposed on top of communities, that governments and international organisations have predetermined ideas about what the needs and vulnerabilities are of communities and kind of uh, sweep in, or sweep in, if you will, and uh, implement a range of activities almost regardless of what communities want. And in addition, we noticed that those policies and programmes and initiatives relied on gender stereotypes. One of the things that all three of us were really interested in is the way in which those gender stereotypes play out in countering violent extremism almost as much as they do in our understanding of violent extremism itself. Emily's uh, current work is very much focused on critiquing the way in which the idea of a mother is instrumentalised within countering terrorism work without actually giving due regard to the safety of women and the risks we're asking women to um, engage in if they choose to participate in this work. So bringing the three of us together then led us to think, OK, so what is it that we're actually claiming and what is it that we're actually interested in and how can we go about generating some evidence and some data that might begin to fill in some of the gaps around gender and community. So first and foremost, as is the nature of uh, academic work, we went hunting for funding uh, and funding, I have to admit, shaped part of this research project's final design. We were fortunate enough to acquire funding from the Canadian government and that helped us uh, select the five countries that ended up being our main participants. In the end, we interviewed and engaged in focus group workshops with over 250 men, women and children, uh, youth, sorry, uh, so minors, um, teenagers, um, across five countries. And in addition, we wanted to have a comparative element. We wanted to understand whether or not ideas around violent extremism were replicated across different communities. So not just across different countries, but also those communities who are affected by different types of violent extremism and terrorism. One of, and we admit this, one of the limitations of our work is we really only considered two different types of violent extremism. We looked at um, violent extremism that is associated with Islamist uh, ideologies and beliefs, and we looked at violent extremism that is associated with right-wing extremism. This meant that the gap in our research is an opportunity for others, uh, which is to look at um, the far left, um, anarchist groups, environmentalist groups and other definition, other groups that might fall within definitions of terrorism in different countries. But we felt that the two, these two groups represented some of the major concerns, at least within the European policy space. So what is it that we chose to do? Well, the first thing that we chose to do was to really focus on community and place. And this is drawing on the criticisms of the global preventing violent extremism work, which says again, that within the Northern European and um, sorry, within the European and North American context, this is very much imposed on communities. And yet elsewhere in the world, there is the expectation that communities are brought on board, that they are recognized as stakeholders. So we wanted to embody that and, and work with that in our own work and ensure that the communities helped shape our research questions, that they were part and parcel of the understanding of violent extremism, and we worked with the concept of the milieu. For those of you that haven't yet had the pleasure of reading our book, uh, you will also find a shorter version that focuses just on the milieu, 
by Liz Pearson and Emily Winterbotham. They published this back in 2017, where they talked about the specifics of the milieu approach. And really, the thing that I want to bring out to you today about the milieu approach is recognising how communities are grounded in places, how our local connections shape our interactions with the wider kind of global understandings of violent extremism. Often it is very local concerns that help shape the uh, ways in which and how individuals and groups interact in violent extremist ways. A very, very simple example can be taken from my own hometown here in Birmingham in the United Kingdom. It's about a planning concern and a question around immigration. Birmingham is the second largest city in the United Kingdom with approximately five and a half million people living within the metropolitan area. One of the greatest concerns, however, is the way in which the city appears to become segregated over time. In fact, Donald Trump, not someone I would normally be quoting, I have to admit, accused my home city as being a hotbed of radicalization and a no-go area for non-Muslims. To some extent, there are serious questions about why it is that certain cities, certain places appear, on the surface at least, to give rise to greater levels of radicalization or affiliation and support to violent extremists than other places. Could we in fact be seeing violent extremism as an urban phenomenon? And here political geographers, such as Sara Freganese, who wrote um, a, a book that's called um, uh, the radical city or something like that. Um, again, if you Google her, she's an awesome political geographer. Um, in her work, she talks about the way uh, cities are structured and how this might in itself form part of the radicalization process. Now, we took this idea and looked at communities as they were self-defining. So when we were doing our research, we didn't wish to turn around and say, oh, we're going to look at a particular kind of community. Instead, we went to where the communities are. So we went to their local centres, we went to the youth centres, we went to the community centres um, and as a result of that we found different groups, different communities defining themselves in particular kinds of ways. Returning back to my home city though, one of the questions is that where we see segregation happening. Even closer to home, in my own small subsection of Birmingham, was a counter-terrorism operation now quite some time ago, known as Project Champion. Project Champion put into place covert CCTV cameras. These covert CCTV cameras were designed to pick up uh, the number plates of anyone who drove into a particular area and who drove out of it. It was presented to the wider community, including my own suburb, as being something to do with street crime. It was presented as being to help the community deal with graffiti or mindless vandalism. But in fact, as later investigations turned out to show, it was an, a counter-terrorism operation that encircled the Muslim majority area of Birmingham. In doing so, it fundamentally undermined the relationship between this community and the police. This meant that this city was an helpful space in order to really unpack some of the case um, issues that we were talking about. How is violent extremism understood within these communities where they have these uh, wider, more widely imposed uh, mechanisms of surveillance that didn't actually address their specific security needs? Their security needs within this community weren't to do with violent extremism, but were much more to do with street crime. So how do we navigate that? Well, for us as researchers, as I said, it's about not predetermining who the community is or indeed what their needs are. The second part to our approach is also recognising and trying to understand a bit more about how it is that far right extremism seems to be embedding within certain communities. There is an understanding that far right extremism is as a result of um, poverty, social exclusion, the white young men being left behind. And these kinds of narratives are things that seem to be held for far right extremism, but not so much for other forms of extremism, or at least so it is here in the UK. And we wanted to test whether that was also the case in the other countries. In addition, 
we wanted to see whether or not communities were able to recognise and respond to far-right extremism in the way that they're expected to in relation to uh, extremism associated with Islam. So again, that was one of the questions is about do communities understand, recognise, see extremism when it relates to the far right, especially in white majority areas. Now, the third part to our approach was to explicitly ask questions about gender. Now, some might say that by deliberately asking questions about gender, you are somehow automatically making your findings biased, right? If we're asking questions about gender, should we really be surprised that our conclusion, or one of them, is that gender matters? Well, I'd suggest to you that actually, by explicitly asking questions about gender, we're able to do more than a show and tell. Some of the criticisms that we have about feminist research to date is it's really about describing a situation rather than trying to uncover the drivers and the mechanisms of gender and how it connects in a constitutive manner to violent extremism. In addition, some of the questions we have around gender is there's an automatic assumption that gender equals women. It's a binary. It's like whenever someone says, oh, this is a talk about gender, everyone assumes this is going to be a talk about gender, um, meaning a talk about women. And all we're going to do is talk about why do women as exceptional freaks happen to involve in terrorism? We wanted to uncover a bit more about gender. And in order to do that in relation to men, we had to ask about masculinity explicitly because masculinity is the hidden assumptive. Right. Nobody asks direct questions about masculinity when we talk about gender. So we had to ask those questions in order to get people to talk about masculinity in a more direct form. And so we were very mindful of the way in which gender is relational. It's about the interactions between men and women. It's about different power relationships, it's performative, but it is also about masculinity as much as it's about femininity. It's about men as men. So questions here are about whether or not we can see uh, extremism as being a form of toxic masculinity. That is something that often gets talked about. Uh, someone who, who takes criticism with this approach, I, 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 yeah, that would be fair, would be David Jury Smith. Um, David, working in Australia and focusing much more on Indonesia, raises some serious questions about this willingness to ascribe violent extremism to toxic masculinity as if somehow it is divorced from other forms of masculinity. In the same way that sometimes we wish to say that women who are involved in violent extremism are somehow deviant forms of women and that they're somehow separated apart from other forms of femininity. Yet we know that when we look at how violent extremist groups operate, ideals around gender seem very stable. There are questions over what it means to be a good woman, but often these are tied up with societal norms and expectations. They don't necessarily transgress societal norms as much as we might expect in practice. Similarly for men, if we're so willing to say these are toxic forms of masculinity, then we're trying to separate it out and not make these connections to broader society. Here, of course, should you be willing, you could take on uh, Karen Gentry's work in her most recent book, Disordered Violence. Karen puts forward a really, um, actually, yes, it is quite a controversial and provocative perspective on what is referred to, she refers to as misogynist terrorism, where she lays bare the connections between misogyny, wider society and masculinity in the structuring of violence, both in forms of violent extremism, but also in wider society. She's not alone in this, though. The UNDP has recently written a report, came out um, in June this year, um, called Misogyny, the Violent Extremist Gateway. So again, we want to ask questions about why it is that in general, we seek to separate out masculinity in violent extremism as somehow being so separate, so diverse from other forms of masculinity. So in the final few minutes, I'm gonna tell you what I found. Um, one of the joys of uh, doing these things on Teams is you can easily lose track of time. Um, but here are my conclusions that I'm going to tell you what we found. And of course, hopefully they will provoke a few things for you. The first of these is that active listening as a method for understanding violent extremism, but also for countering and preventing violent extremism is incredibly important. We found that by having these multiple focus groups across different countries, 
and by listening in an active manner to our participants, that they show deep insight into violent extremism. They also showed deep awareness of how preventing violent extremism programs were not supporting their communities across these five countries. In active listening, we do raise a couple of questions. Does active listening mean agreeing with those that you're listening to? And for ourselves and our research assistants, this raised a number of questions. How do you actively listen and engage with individuals who express racist, misogynist, homophobic, xenophobic views who might glorify terrorism in your focus groups? What are the ethics for us doing this work, whether we're scholars or as practitioners? And some of the guidelines that we work towards was really about recognizing that as active listening, we didn't have to agree and that we could politely engage them in these discussions. But of course, even that politeness might be taken as sympathizing, as agreeing with. So again, we had to find these ways of how do we tease out some of the points of disagreement, both within the focus groups, but also between ourselves and those of the communities. And that was something that also then allowed us to really think about OK, what is violent extremism to these communities? How do they recognize it? For the focus groups that were primarily involved with um, Muslim communities, there was extreme frustration with public definitions of violent extremism. There was extreme frustration even with us as researchers for, for wanting to ask these questions. And we found that in those focus groups, their agendas shifted quite dramatically from those that we had assumed. The direction of the focus group shifted away from being able to say, oh, well, violent extremism, we all know what that is, that's Daesh or that's um, so-called Islamic State or that's these other groups. And instead, they wanted to talk about violent extremism as they experienced it in the form of Islamophobia. And they were then kind of coming back to us and saying, well, where's our security? Where are our needs when we're being faced on these daily microaggressions to live in continuous vulnerability? Interestingly, for the far right communities, they identified violent extremism very quickly as to do with Islamist inspired groups, right? But they couldn't, and even where in communities where they had faced um, protests or marches by far right extremist groups, where far right extremist groups say had um, smeared mosques with pork products, um, or where there had been van xenophobic vandalism, these communities couldn't recognize that that might constitute a form of violent extremism. That was just young men behaving stupidly. And that was really interesting, seeing how they couldn't or um, hadn't yet thought through the connections between what they were experiencing and what other groups were. So this leads to the second methodological point, which is that communities have knowledge. Communities have knowledge in the sense that doing research on terrorism, people often say, oh, can I go and talk to some terrorists, please? Um, I hear this a lot from undergraduates who think they're going to do some research, and I'm like, well, no. Um, that's highly unlikely. Um, access is one thing, risk assessment, security. Anyway, just you can just reel off why that's highly unlikely. We do know of some researchers who have been able to talk to terrorists um, and talk to violent extremism extremists directly. Um, in fact, Liz did this as a number of years in a form of ethnography, but it comes at considerable risk to the researcher. So one question is then, how do we do, how do we find out knowledge? And in fact, these communities have their own knowledge and that they can be thought of as having expert knowledge because they understand the conditions in, um, of the community. They also recognize the processes and why certain individuals might have left their communities to join extremist groups or indeed why certain extremist groups are entering into them and they have this knowledge of the community. So to take um, a very old-fashioned approach of subaltern studies, the uh, subaltern speaks back, they know what they're talking about, we, we need to listen to the communities to, in order to understand them better. So I'm going to switch to um, the policy points here um, which come out of all of this. There are two really. Um, the first one is around evidence and monitoring and evaluation. All of the community groups, focus groups in all of the countries pointed to the fact that the preventing violent extremism programs or the countering violent extremism programs within their communities weren't working. 
that they had experienced multiple iterations of these programs and that they nevertheless faced the same in system systemic problems. Part of this is because they felt and indeed, when we also talked to some um, professionals in this space, that monitoring and evaluation wasn't really built into these programs. And specifically, what was not built into these programs was a localized understanding of their effectiveness or success measures, but also success measures based on gender. In other words, we don't know whether or not these violent countering violent extremism programs are more or less effective when we're talking about preventing young men from joining violent extremist groups or preventing young women. Now, one of the back kind of responses I get is, oh, well, we don't really need to worry about women because they're not really a security threat. They're like 13% of the violent extremist population, so meh. And also they don't really engage in the frontline violence. Well, therein lies one of the other definitional problems that comes into play here. If our countering violent extremism programs and our preventing violent extremism programs are only concerned with the immediate security effects of a terrorist attack, then perhaps we're missing something about the wider security concerns of our communities, but also the ripple and ongoing effects of some of those um, terrorist attacks. They, have, they don't just stop in time. If we're coming up to the anniversary of the September the 11th attacks, people say that that was just a day is a tragic day. Of course it is. But in fact, it's not. It didn't stop on September the 11th. The effects of that rolls on out through time. So too are preventing violent extremism programs that might have started over a decade ago and are still ongoing, but not with monitoring and evaluation. So we need to think about our definitions. But the other thing that comes to mind here as a policy um, element is that Although there is a temptation to lump together violent extremism, regardless of ideology, our research demonstrates that, in fact, these are quite different phenomena with different drivers, with different ideological kind of backgrounds, uh, with different uh, recruitment patterns, with different activity patterns and with different effects within their communities. And perhaps we are making a fundamental mistake classing everything as violent extremism. And this then requires us as policymakers and as academics to recognize where there may well be similarities, but also that this homogeneous term, this monolithic term might not serve us well when it comes to defining and understanding, but more importantly, preventing and countering the term I'm about to critique, violent extremism, because um, we are of course left with it. Finally, and it will come as no surprise to you given the nature of the talk, gender matters. In all of these things, gender matters at the level of the individual. In other words, it matters about how particular individuals end up joining or supporting violent extremist groups, but also their exit. Exits are just as gendered as radicalization. Secondly, gender matters at the level of the organization. Who gets involved in what? is informed by gender roles and gender norms within communities. And thirdly, it matters at the ideological level. Gender based harms, ideas about what it means to be a good man and a good woman are embedded into the terrorist extremist narratives themselves. They constitute their ideological framing as much as it shapes the individuals. We can see how extremist groups utilize ideas about gender to justify and explain and embed their ideology, in, especially in terms of changing governance structures or particular policies. And it is on that note that gender matters that I will end this uh, slightly longer than 20 minutes. It is 30 uh, talk. Thank you so much for listening. Great, thank you so much um, for sharing your very fascinating findings. I'm sure that we're going to have a lot of questions here today. Um, as, as well as many questions that I have uh, for you. Um, but perhaps we can start off with just a rather foundational question here, which is, and also the title of, of today's webinar, which is um, in the book, you talk about gendered radicalization specifically. So can you please discuss what is gendered radicalization? And how is it distinct from other models of radicalization within the existing literature? 
I mean, thank you so much for that question. Um, so one of the issues we have with uh, research and indeed policy in this space is that it is often gender blind. And we see this even in data sets. So when we look, for example, as you, as you might have wanted to do, it's only been very recently that um, countries have started to disaggregate data according to gender. So for example, if you wanted to find out how many women were prosecuted on terrorism matters across the European Union, you had to spend some time hunting down that information or even within uh, individual countries, because often it was just this number of terrorists were arrested and detained, not broken down by gender. Over the past few years, we have seen a slight change in those data sets. But as um, Joanna Cook and Gina Vale in their work noted, the amount of effort to, they had to uncover it just in order to find out how many women were present in ISIS in order because they couldn't rely on official data sets because nothing, uh, not an, an insufficient amount were recorded according to gender. Now, this is important partly for that evidence point, right? We need to make sure that our data is disaggregated according to gender and age, and I would say other social markers as well, in order to really tease out um, these effects. But this also applies for terrorism research and our models on radicalization. The majority of models of radicalization presume that, well, they take these large data sets and forget that most of those within those data sets are men. And then they ignore gender as a result. So as a what we then find are these theories of radicalization that are gender blind. And gender blind doesn't mean gender neutral, right? It has consequences. And it means that we don't look at um, masculinity because these are just people. And so the male norm is assumed to be the human norm, but also we don't question how men come into play and how masculinity works. So when, for example, we're looking at mortality salience, uh, so that in non-psychological psychospeak is um, an obsession with death, which is one of the things that people often talk about in relation to radicalization to violent extremist groups. This plays out differently for men and women, and it's gendered as well. Or if we take this idea of wanting to be a hero, so a quest for significance. Again, both men and women have a quest for significance, but it's gendered. So we see in men, the quest for significance is often framed in terms of being a hero, a breadwinner. Um, it's also framed as being um, kind of uh, an alpha male. I hate that language, but that's one of the things. Um, but I'm wanting to be a defender and using violence. Whereas for women, that quest for significance is also about um, helping others, about saving others. And so it manifests itself slightly differently. So gendered radicalization is about recognizing how gender informs the radicalization pathway and processes as a whole. So not just measuring men and women, but that's the first step, but also recognizing how these processes are gendered. Um, so they're gendered experiences and rely on gender ideologies. And I, we argue that only by having that can we actually gain a fuller understanding of both men and women's participation within it? Yeah, thank you so much for, for that explanation, but also demonstrating the types of implications that it can have in framing P slash CVE programming efforts to understand how that gender lens impacts everything from the early stages of recruitment and radicalization, those types of narratives all the way to, you know, the behaviors and, and the engagement that, that men and women have with their involvement in, in these groups, um, as as well as, um, you know, in instances where there might be prosecutorial um, effects, you know, understanding, you know, how that is shaped by these, these gendered behaviors and dynamics within these groups. And then, of course, with the leaving aspects and understanding that de-radicalization initiatives should support um, men and women quite differently. Um, it's uh, so I'm going to take the opportunity here to also compare this against some of the research that I've been doing on far right women. Um, and I look specifically at influencers on social media. So this is a particular subset, but I think it does have some very interesting parallels to your findings within the book, which is that I often think about recruitment 
and radicalization interchangeably. So sometimes an individual can be recruited and then radicalized, and sometimes it's vice versa, but oftentimes it's an interconnected process at play. And while I was doing research for this book, I was focusing in particular on women, but exploring their gender narratives of recruitment and radicalization and propaganda sharing. And although these types of narratives did focus on aspects of femininity versus masculinity, I had expected that for many of these women that I was researching that they would be recruiting other women into the far right. But I actually found that they were recruiting mostly men uh, into, into the far right, which was, I think, an unexpected finding, but one that really shows how we need to see this interchange between femininity and masculinity and the role that plays in these gendered narratives. Mm -hmm. I think that's hugely fascinating and does pose a real contrast uh, actually with how young women in uh, from Muslim communities might be recruited into uh, violent extremist groups. So we have these stereotypes that actually young women in particular are duped into joining extremist groups um, through love or emotions like so there's this idea of the um, although actually this is a phrase used on social media by um, Islamist violent extremist supporters, a jihadi, uh, which is like this uh, prototypical uh, jihadist fighter, if you will, who's also sensitive and caring. Um, and so there's th this framing. But actually, the majority of women who are recruited um, or young women who are recruited into violent extremist groups of, from Islamist groups are recruited by other women often within their own community. Um, some of it's online, um, and Liz talks about this in another piece of her work, another work of hers, looking at women's recruitment online, and she argues that women were more likely to be recruited online um, because of notions of perda, whereas men were more likely to be recruited in public spaces. Um, so, for example, with the local takeaway shop or in the, car, or in the um, playground or whatever. Um, or some would say the um, outside mosques or bookshops. And she said, you don't find those same places for women. Um, instead, you find it online. In my own work, um, this is somewhere, and I, I like it, is where Liz and I sometimes disagree because I find um, women are also recruited in semi-public spaces. So this would be like uh, women's circles, um, so women-only groups and also online in women only groups and it's women recruiting other women so your kind of findings for the far right is super interesting because it's about how their ideologies kind of connect and what's an appropriate gender norms um, yeah yeah absolutely and and i was also thinking about um this um resistance perhaps of looking into women as a potential security threat, right? In terms of, well, it's it's not often so visible or apparent, and so it's not often taken seriously. Um, and I think, you know, given this this audience here, um, many of you might be familiar with watching the the trial of Philip Montus, who had attempted to uh, attack a mosque uh, outside of Oslo. And during the trial, it was revealed that Montus, um, you know had the national socialist views which which isn't which isn't really like that's a uh, uh, stark but i think what was underreported uh at least in the media coverage of the trial was that once has discussed how he started to become obsessed with watching uh far-right women um online and that uh in, in particular one individual who runs this uh, white nationalist alternative media site and that Montes became obsessed with the idea of finding a wife and having children and settling in the Norwegian countryside, right? And this was left almost completely out of any public uh, co coverage or media coverage of, of the trial. But I think it was such a really fascinating insight into sort of understanding how interlinked um, gender is in, in understanding um, perhaps the, the types of very insidious effects that, that women might have um, within these milieus. Absolutely. And Evian, you, you mentioned a really uh, important point there about um, future expectations and this idea of building hope for the future, um, but also how it, in a lot of uh, the groups at the moment, they are defined, or at least within um, the groups that we found very much in a heterosis normative manner. Um, and this I'm, I'm kind of badly segueing into a question in the Q&A here about whether other sexualities um, and gender identities might be taken into account. 
And so one of the, one of the con questions we had was how, how does sexuality, sexual orientation, and also gender identity feature within uh, the communities and how did the focus groups treat them? And we found that was an incredibly uh, challenging conversation for people to have. Um, and they didn't necessarily have the vocabulary um, in order to have that conversation and link it back to violent extremism. Um, and that I think is a, a problem for our research and I think for research generally, um, where we assume this binary of gender identities of male and female. Um, one of the things that I get super uh, frustrated with is the phrase um, uh, where we talk about female terrorists, female jihadists, as if this is a sexual ident uh, a sex identity. Um, and actually it is a social constructed identity. It's the combination of assumptions around womanhood and what it means to be a woman, plus the social construction around being a terrorist or a jihadist um, in their language. So it's that combination. So when I see this phrase, oh, a female terrorist or a female ter uh, terrorist fighter, FTF, it just reinforces this gender essentialism that um, I find quite troubling because to my mind, it is both the way in which, uh, sorry, it's both how gender is within our societies as a constructed thing and how terrorism and violent extremism is constructed. Um, so that's where that's coming from. Uh, and it's not a, a perfect answer. Um, I would agree with you on that. Um, but it, it's about where we're at at the moment um, and I hope it helps. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, and my apologies to the audience because for some reason I'm having some technical issues with the Q&A function so that the team is on hand to sort of help me um, to, to to share those those questions. So I, I do apologize if I'm not getting to, to the audience here. Um, I suppose you touched upon this um, and in, in the sense of exploring different uh, narratives of radicalization for both the, the jihadi and, and far-right extremist groups. Would you mind elaborating on perhaps some of the other gendered dynamics of, of violent extremism and, and CVE for both um, jihadi and far-right extremist groups? What are some of the similarities and, and differences and how did these vary in the different countries you researched since you did look at um, a sort of a cross-national comparison? Yeah, thank you so much for that. So um, one of the interesting points of comparison um, across the different countries is we, we were expecting um, very different results, if I'm honest, um, across the different countries. Uh, we were expecting that um, different histories of these groups and different patterns of migration um, would lead to quite different um, expectations. And what we found within uh, the focus groups across all five countries where they were focused on Muslim focus groups um, is an increasing uh, resistance to focusing on violent extremism, uh, an increasing uh, um, desire to see Islamophobia as linked to violent extremism and as an expression of violent extremism that they were then suffering, and also that they we found considerable similarity in the types of PV and CVE programming that these communities had experienced and also similar failures. Um, so this suggests that there's a globalization of these programs that are kind of learning from each other, which makes sense as a epistemic community, if you will, um, that, that's at play, but we're also not learning from each other's mistakes, I would suggest um, in that case. Now, with the far right groups, this is where we did see some, some differences and it's in part because of the timing of our research. So we were in France shortly after the Paris attacks and this meant that for uh, non-Muslim French communities that we uh, worked with, they were very, very much focused on perceiving Frenchness as being under threat, um, both linguistically, but also from violent extremism uh, from Islamist groups. And that was very much the focus there in a way that with far right group uh, communities outside of France, the discussion in non-Muslim focus groups around violent extremism, there was more of a willingness to, despite what I said in, in the first 20 minutes, there was a, a degree of willingness to see the far right as problematic. Um, but again, their explanations for it 
mm. uh, were very much kind of saying, oh, well, this is just young men or this is because they're socially excluded. And then there'll be a move towards quite xenophobic or racist assumptions. Um, and so th those were some of the things that we found across all of the different uh, focus groups as well. I mean, I was wondering in, in your research, when you were talking about women influencers, did you also have women influencers in diff from different countries or were they all from one particular group? And what differences did you find? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I have primarily been looking at um, female foreign influencers in North America and in Europe, but primarily the, the UK. Um, However, I have also done research looking at far right women in India as well, um, and also their role as, as influencers within these spaces. But um, I mean, there's certainly some similarities in the sense of how they use social media as, as a tool to spread propaganda and, and to sort of um, mobilize. Um, but I think in terms of the radicalization and recruitment aspects, these are slightly different. Um, part of it is because um, in, in India, the far right is highly organized and, and structured, so there is already quite a very strong um, group presence there um, uh, in the sense that these women sort of are already involved in, in, in sort of these long established groups. But at least in North America and Europe, you know, the far right scene is quite fragmented and oftentimes you have individuals who are not affiliated with any groups or organizations and so the networks are, are quite spread out which also i think goes into the what you were saying earlier about looking at milieus and understanding this as an approach to understand you know the ways in which individuals are are sort of drawn um in, into these networks yeah uh, yeah and i thought that place is really place is really the fragmentation is really important we kind of assume there's a global plug and play like there's a global far right narrative or there's a global uh, jihadist narrative and although I've just said here are all the similarities there were these very localized responses you know so for example in one of the UK cities um, the local council would have to withdraw some funding for a particular community center that had a significant impact on a white community um, and around the same time it was perceived that slightly further down the road in a more Muslim majority area um, they had recently had funding to um, make their, um, the, ch the children's park nicer. Um, and even though these are two completely disparate events, right, they were not connected events, the, the closing down of the centre and the, the making the park look pretty were very, very different. The, a very local far right group was able then to start to manipulate the tensions and create this idea of um, there being competition. Whereas actually what we're seeing are two very um, equally um, disconnected and, and impoverished communities being kind of sidelined through widened um, funding cuts and so on. Um, but they, they prevented the two groups from seeing their shared interest, if you will, mm. um, and pitched them against each other. But that narrative didn't really work, say, uh, quite so much in some of the larger cities. Um, where instead, and this is a really interesting point I, I find is how some far right groups use LGP, LGBTQ rights as something to say, this is why we should resist immigration from Muslim majority areas and why Islam is problematic. And they highlight or, or try to demonstrate that Islam is somehow uniquely homophobic. Um, incidentally, um, it's not. Um, and also there are many, many different diverse interpretations of Islam and the holy texts that do not support homophobia in any shape or form. And I can put, give you loads of links to demonstrate that, which is also a whole different uh, discussion point. But so we see some far right groups using that. And again, in my home city, this was something that really came to play um, when some local uh, parents in a Muslim majority area objected to sex education classes in primary school specifically that it included talking about same-sex relationships and same-sex marriages. And this was then taken up by the far right as being an example of Muslim households and mm -hmm. Muslim parents and schools not wanting to fall into line with European or British Christian values. Um, but from the parents' point of view, they were actually seeing the introduction of this new sex education program as linking it to the counter-terrorism program that I mentioned earlier. Mm 
they mm -hmm. saw it as a state imposition and they didn't see it as about LGBTQ rights. They saw it as linked to prevent and a broader thing about demonstrating how their schools were not properly British and they were resisting. They saw themselves as resisting preventing violent extremism programs. Um, so there's an interesting play, but other far right groups are just as homophobic um, as some of the Islamist groups can be. Right. Um, so I think that's a really interesting um, play here as well about how these different sets of um, sexual minority rights come into play in these extremist groups and we can't assume one thing or the other. Yeah, that's a very interesting observation to have detected that, um, I mean, it has been well documented that the far right in Europe does rely upon these homo-nationalist narratives to demonstrate allegedly that that Islam is anti-LGBTQ rights, um, etc. Um, but to see that in your research as linked specifically to the government's programs, uh, CBE programs, I think is quite a unique aspect that um, I, I sort of want to turn to now and and please do for the audience send in your, your questions if you do have any, but I'm going to sort of abuse my position here um, and sort of transitioning more into um, the recommendations for P slash CBE programs. So, I mean, you suggest adopting the milieu approach as a tool for practitioners and in program designers. And can you tell us a little bit more about that? And, and how is this different from other approaches that have been taken in studies of CBE? Thank you so much for that opportunity. Um, so Emily and I in our different forms have also spent quite some time engaging in the broader policy spaces um, and practitioner spaces um, in PVE. And we were very aware of how in many cases programs are designed by experts. So we are often, uh, including myself, right? I'm a, a part of this uh, industry, um, and we can use that term prerogative, prerogative negatively as well, um, where we are asked to come in to do an evaluation of some kind, to see where the risks and vulnerabilities are, and to make some recommendations. But this is hugely problematic because unless we can do some primary uh, research when we know something about the communities, we're missing so much about what the local needs are. And so what we recommend is that rather than predetermining what the community is and what the community needs are, we actually start from the point of view that communities know something about violent extremism. They understand their own condition and they should have uh, the opportunity to shape and participate in preventing violent extremism and countering violent extremism programming at the level of design not just as beneficiaries um, where experts swoop in and go, oh, we're going to give you some tolerance lessons. I mean, I'm doing uh, deliberately uh, generalized uh, perspective. I, I'm well aware they're more nuanced than that. But we would strongly recommend that we work within the communities from the start. Um, and that means mm. working at the community or milieu level recognizing how communities connect to each other, how people um, operate on a day to day basis and where they see violent extremism operating in their lives and how they can move and bring that upwards. The second part that connects to this is questioning our own gender assumptions and really questioning what are we starting with? Um, do are we assuming that women are going to be supporters of preventing violent extremism programs. Mm. We're assuming that they are somehow naturally moderate um, and that they're going to um, come in and de-radicalize their sons if only they knew the signs, right? We have to really step back from our assumptions and start with what do men and women know about violent extremism? What are their views? And then work with them on that basis. Um, rather than our own assumptions. And that also means not glibly saying, oh, when we work with individuals, oh, I just work with an individual, I don't see their gender. I think, again, that's so as problematic in de-radicalization work um, and not recognizing our own gender biases that come into play here um, and what spaces then become accessible to us. So for the policymaker, for the practitioner, our real kind of starting point is please start with communities and start with both men and women um, as participants, as equal participants in this space who have knowledge that is worth knowing. The second uh, policy recommendation that I would really, really make is please, 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 please gather some data. 
um, build into your programming monitoring and evaluation processes. Build that in from the start and gather the data and also be really clear about what your output is. What's the theory of change that you're in that you're thinking about here? Because so often PVE and CV programming is simply measured on the level of activity. Here is what I did. Here's the number of outreach engagements we did. Here's where the talk went to. Here are the schools we spoke with. And it's all about what we as practitioners or academics have done rather than what is the effect but also recognizing that effect is going to be gendered it may be more successful for men maybe less successful for women we don't know because we haven't gathered the data so the second big plea is please 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 gather disaggregated data and build that get data gathering into your monitoring and evaluation frameworks um, as a, a really technical point um, and make it available to uh, the likes of us so we can support people in these processes and in the program designs. Great, yeah, that's absolutely valuable uh, recommendations and advice there. Um, I suppose I did have one small follow up here, which was um, in terms of engaging with communities to shape these programs and policies, but that, that itself seems a bit of a broad term. Could, could you specify perhaps the types of, of individuals and in actors within these communities that, that perhaps could offer the best knowledge um, sources for, for, for policymakers and practitioners? Yeah, so um, this raises a really interesting question and one that we've uh, struggled with in the first uh, phases of our research. So um, in most of our research sites, we were not local, right? So here's me saying we need to do local research with local participants and, and we're not local. So um, and what that then meant was relying on gatekeepers um, in order to gain access into communities, in order to promote the, the workshops that we wanted to do, in order to gain access to spaces. Um, and that was in the first instance quite problematic because it meant that the people who turned up were the people who were already engaging with the gatekeeper. So we then had to divert and um, find ways of reaching out more broadly because one of the concerns that um, I've found and is also expressed within communities is that often it's the typical uh, community leader mm -hmm. who is seen to be representative of the community and actually, sometimes the community leader have don't represent the community as much as they think they do um, on a number of levels, uh, not least because oftentimes the community leader uh, may represent a particular interest uh, within the community. They make uh, certain assumptions. Um, and for example, um, people will often say, oh, you know, for Muslim community groups, we have to go to the mosque to find out where the community representatives are, as if it's always religion that defines, um, or religiosity that defines these spaces and these communities. Um, and in many ways, it's not the mosque that's the center of this particular community. There are other spaces and we have to look for those and not make assumptions that, oh, this is a Muslim majority area, let's all go to the mosque to find where the Muslims are. Um, and really start questioning that um, in my own area, uh, it's actually the swimming centre. Uh, it's where lots of people congregate. You wouldn't have known. Anyway, and similarly, we see that in uh, white community groups, although there's a tendency not to go to the church for this because we presume secularism amongst white communities, um, which again excludes those who do see um, Christianity as the centre of their kind of community because we go, oh no, this is a white area, we're going to go somewhere else. In white communities, one of the questions that then emerges is that we don't have the same inculcation of community leader. Um, so because over the past 20 or 30 years across North America and Europe, we have seen kind of this idea of multiculturalism and needing to work with community leaders and working with communities, they've become kind of professionalized. So there's almost the semi-professional community leader for minority groups, which we don't have for white community groups. So they're much, they're actually incredibly difficult to access that way. So in what we ended up doing was going to um, community centres, um, also the local shopping centre, um, various places where people would be and advertise that we were going to do these focus groups. 
um, in order to get a, a broader range of people. Um, so again, this is why working at the community level and recognizing that communities aren't always what we think they are and really questioning our own biases becomes so important for research. Yeah, thank you very much for elaborating on that and for pointing out um, you know, some of the criticisms that, that come because um, you know, oftentimes these de facto community leaders is often structured on gender lines as well. And so that's important to, to, to bear in mind. Um, so it seems like we're running out of time now. Um, I, I feel like we could go on and on about, you know, discussing these issues. I mean, it's really quite fascinating and I have learned so much um, from your findings and insights, and I'm sure that others listening in today have as well. So thank you very much for that. Um, before uh, we sign off, do you have, um, is, there, is there a way that, that audience members can, can follow your work? Oh, Evian, thank you so much for that opportunity. Um, yes, uh, I am a prolific re retweeter um, on Twitter. So um, you can find me on Twitter at K underscore E underscore Brown 27. Um, and there you'll be bombarded with loads of retweets about counterterrorism and terrorism, but also my own work will be there, uh, as well as the usual university professional pages where they get around to updating publications. Um, and of course, through that, you can email me as well. I must say it's been a real pleasure doing this uh, with you, Evian, and also Nupi for um, inviting me to talk about this book. I really hope that my co-authors uh, do not feel too embarrassed by my responses um, to their <laughs> to um, shared work. Um, and I would hope that all of you get some chance at least to flick through the book. Um, it's available online as an ebook, but also in hardback um, through Palgrave. And I think the link is in the chat or Q&A. So thank you all ever so much. And yeah, um, find me on Twitter is probably the easiest thing to say. Great, thank you so much, Catherine. And please do check out uh, her new book. I think we can all really learn something here from these fascinating research findings. So um, thank you to everyone who's joined us today. Uh, and please do stay in touch with us and check out Newbie's website for upcoming events. So thank you, everybody. Thank you so much.